Dr. Lau. How are you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. It's so so great. I've watched your videos on YouTube and also at the Advanced Study Weekends with Dr. McDougall and read your book, The Pleasure Trap. Oh, very um, cool. And a uh, big fan. All right. So is there anything, uh, just for the benefit of viewers, you'd like to just give us a little background um, or what you're do working on uh, currently, just to help people understand? Well, I think uh, we're always working on something at True North and at McDougall program. Uh, John has been uh, working on a study with multiple sclero uh, sclerosis for several years, and uh, I think that, that one's still sort of percolating. And uh, we are at True North uh, working on something uh, very interesting, which is that uh, we, we think that fasting, uh, water fasting along with a healthy plant-based diet may be a very good um, way to deal with certain cancers. And so we actually just published in the British Medical Journal, which is a leading journal, um, a, a case study of a woman who came in. Uh, it was came from Stanford Medical uh, School, and she uh, had a stage 3 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer, and she was refusing the medical treatment, and she came, did a water fast, and ate really healthy for the next year, and got, it. I think, about 80% result. So uh, it, it's pretty exciting to, to watch healthy living uh, do its trick. Yeah. So is there a fasting period and then going to plant-based, or is it a mix of like intermittent yeah. fasting? Yeah. Well, we have people actually make sure fasting process goes well if, you're, if you eat real carefully before, eat real healthy. So we have them make sure that they eat for several days really healthy with us. Then people do a water fast, and then we supervise their what they eat afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in this case... You know, it's a lot. It's hard for people to to uh, eat healthy food real consistently. Uh, it's just not a, it's not the easiest thing for people to do. But in this case, uh, this this lady was obviously extremely motivated. She had had a good response to the fast, and she was hopeful that that healthy living would continue the process, and it did. And uh, so it's it's a very exciting thing to see. And and I was. Uh, I was surprised that a journal of the, of the stature of the British Medical Journal would write it up uh, or accept our write-up, and they did. Uh, they had us jump through an awful lot of hoops. They wanted to see the original data. They wanted to make sure we weren't, you know, flakes. But they published it uh, in December of 2015, and we're real excited about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, for the like, for, for people that aren't familiar, I, you know, I, I recommend The Pleasure Trap, but um, would you say, like, to summarize that, it's, it's basically the mismatch between yeah. sort of our biology and what's kind of available in today's environment of eating. Absolutely, you know, the, well, the, the, what the pleasure trap is is the pleasure trap is a is a uh, joining of of two things that aren't supposed to be joined, and that is that we have a natural history that makes us human, and it, uh, then then if you have a modern environment has creations or concoctions that that natural history was never supposed to run into, then you can run into problems. So if you were to imagine a world, uh, say your average house cat just loves to, to chase squiggly things. You know, that's what they do. And you can imagine a world where suddenly if it walked out, uh, your cat walked out into the yard, there would be thousands of these little things wiggling that, that essentially look like rodents' tails. I mean, that, that poor cat would just be not know which thing to jump on. It would be just overwhelmed. And uh, that's essentially kind of what the world is that, that humans face in a way. And that is that they're, they're being inundated with foods that we're going to end products, other products, but particularly foods that we call in science supernormal stimuli. In other words, they're not the normal stimulation that the species was designed for. They're supernormal. In this case, they're hyper-concentrated in sugar, fat, and salt. And uh, when you do that, it makes it very difficult for people to stay out of it. And that traps their motivational system uh, into doing something that's actually self-destructive when it really feels like it's really the right thing to do. And that's what we call the pleasure trap. Yeah. And um, what's your general advice? Like, obviously, you know, switching to that type of a, of a diet, but with all the stuff that's out there um, in the stores and in the restaurants, like, it's kind of a constant uh, Temptation, I guess you'd say. It sure is, and and I, I would say that it's uh, th there are a few people that could just flip a switch and go the right direction, 
uh, once they learn the right way to go. But that's not true for most people. Most people will go through quite a, a process of, of uh, it's a, a little bit like being in a house of mirrors. You're going to bang your head into the wall a whole bunch of times. And that's fine. The, the important thing is to, that you know generally what direction you should be going. And the, the general direction that we need to keep headed towards is we need to head away from the animal foods and uh, dairy and, and flesh of, of different kinds. Uh, not that this stuff is horrible, terrible poison, even though John McDougall would say it's poison. Uh, I would just say it's mediocre. And the more mediocre that you put in you, essentially, if you, if you think of your health as a, basically a grade point average, your current health is more or less the sum of all the quizzes you've taken in the last couple of years. And uh, if you, every time you eat uh, meat or you eat some greasy thing, um, eat some self-indulgent thing, essentially you just got some mediocre grade on a quiz. And if it's fried chicken, then I, it's an F on that quiz. Now that, uh, that fried chicken is not going to kill you today. It's exceedingly unlikely that it will. If you're right on the edge of a heart attack, uh, it, it could definitely be the thing that would, that would kick you over. Whereas if you'd eaten a salad, you could pull yourself back from the cliff. But in general, we don't think of any one meal or any one decision as being that important because it's not. But cumulatively, how you do on all the quizzes over the next two years is going to determine your grade. Yeah. And, um, and so what we want to have people do is continually moving towards trying to rack up A's and at least B's. So that as they look back over their shoulder, they're feeling better, looking better, and uh, essentially getting getting it under their belt. How you do this? Yeah. So yeah, like a few years ago, I started, um, you know, a starch based essentially diet, and um, I found it somewhat easy in a sense that I switched like 100 percent and I modified what I used to eat. You know, so I was used to eating the same things. Like if I had you know, French fries, I, I make baked fries. If I had pasta, I would have pasta without the oil and the cheese and all that. Cereal, I still had maybe almond milk and or oatmeal instead. So, but since I've been helping people and going online to various um, Facebook groups and YouTube as well, I've noticed like, other than the obvious advice to, you know, eat a plant-based diet and, and eat to your satiated and don't count calories and portions and all that, I noticed there's so many other issues like psychological issues around that so that's kind of what I wanted to focus on more so you know than the diet itself because that's fairly straightforward to me but um, you know I do help people with that but I noticed there's a lot of other issues um, for example let's see here um, there's kind of a a lot of people want uh, quick results you know even though they might have struggled a long time or they've been overweight or unhealthy in some aspect for quite a while when they start these things there's a lot of um, stress about like, well, I didn't, get, I didn't lose any weight. It's been a week, or I, or I gained weight even, or they didn't lose as much as they wanted to, and um, you know, yeah. So how there's a bunch of things like that where I'm going to ask you like how you would, what you would recommend, and what your advice to them is because you know I do sense that stress that they have, and you could say, well, you know, look at it long term. Don't be so, don't weigh yourself every day, stuff like that. But it's just in the mindset of a lot of people. So how would you approach uh, those types of situations? Boy, I think I would uh, go online and look me up for a, a video that I shot called Losing Weight Without Losing Your Mind. Yes. That's and uh, that I shot down in Los Angeles a few years ago, and it's free. And it's a one-hour lecture, and that's something that people need to look at. The People need to understand that if you're 40 pounds overweight – you didn't gain that 40 pounds in, in six weeks. Uh, typically, people, people think they go up and down huge amounts, and, and they, a few people may. But the truth of the matter is, is that the average American woman gains two pounds a year between her 16th birthday and her 36th birthday. So by the time she's 36, she's 40 pounds overweight. And this happens very subtly. So two pounds a year is only about... 7,500, 8,000 calories, and there's 365 days in a year, so essentially she's overeating systematically by about 20 calories a day. So this is actually a very subtle process, 
And what I try to get people to understand is that if they do things healthfully, they may lose, for example, four or five pounds in a month. And that would be that would be very solid it means that I know that they're doing a good job. But four pounds in a four or five pounds in a month, they need to keep in mind that they have rewound the, the, the clock by two years in, in thirty days. And that in four months we can rewind their clock um, tremendously. So in four months we can lose twenty pounds. And and yet that's ten years. Uh, that's 10 years of fixing that we have done. And so th- essentially there, there are several problems that have that arise in this mess. One of them is the fact that weight loss, other weight loss techniques um, utilize the restriction, acute restriction of sodium. So slim fast is a, for example, a, a technique that resulted in a billion dollars for the guy that invented it. It was really smart really savvy and unbelievable, uh, let, me, let me say this carefully so I don't get sued, it would be what we would call an apparent fraud, okay? <laughs> so they, they, uh, they say, give us a week, we'll take off the weight. Well, in a week, you will take off weight, but you won't take off fat. Uh, by, being an ex- by, by drinking chocolate shakes for a week that don't have any sodium, and what happens is, is that your sodium balances reduce, and you excrete a lot of water uh, because you now have less sodium in you. And so very often a big person might be carrying around 10 extra pounds of water because they've been on a high-sodium diet. When they go and drink chocolate shakes for a week, they don't have sodium in them. They can drop 10 pounds, but they haven't dropped any fat. And so all that requires is for that person then two days later to eat a bag of potato chips, finally deciding to eat something. And they can absorb 10 pounds of water in another two days, and now their weight's back up. And then they feel like they're a bad person because they ate instead of doing their chocolate shakes. And they go back to their chocolate shakes, and they lose the 10 pounds again. And we wind up with essentially extraordinarily confused behavior on the part of people. The, uh, to understand that you lose fat at a nice, even, reasonable pace, uh, if you do a brilliant job, you might lose two pounds a week. I mean, and that's talking about towing the line, uh, McDougal Maximum Weight Loss Program, etc. But you're never going to lose 10 pounds. Or if you do, it isn't 10 pounds of fat. It's eight pounds of water because you went on a lower sodium diet and two pounds of fat. So people need to get in touch with the math, and they are actually very out of touch with the math. And the reason they're out of touch with the math is that there's so many confusing things out there. And they're also so desperate to get this problem done, and they just want it over with, and they don't realize that uh, the correct way to do this is what I call the slow, fast way, that you do it right, uh, you change your dietary habits, and like a tortoise, you go after this thing essentially a pound at a time, and you don't look too far into the future, and your job is simply to eat healthy foods this day and make sure we get a good solid B. And uh, if you get an A, great. But our job is to get a B, and we keep at it, and we keep at it. And when we look back over our shoulder three months from now, and you're down 15 pounds, that you know that is a tremendous achievement, and you're well on your way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a pretty difficult transition in so many ways because, first of all, you're telling people not to eat all the stuff that they like and the salt. And not only that, like it's not like just going vegan, but it's okay. You're not supposed to eat salt. You're not supposed to have oil, sugar. So. Or like in McDougal's case, there's a, a minimal amount of it. So that's the first thing. Then you have like with the added vegetables and things, there's a lot more fiber. So people, there's so many posts about bloating and and issues like stomach problems with um, the the change in, in the enzymes. Digestive enzymes haven't really been developed. And um, and then other weight, like you said, other weight loss mechanisms or methods could produce quicker results because of the like the water weight mm-hmm. and um, so there's a lot of uphill battle like going into this world. So like I'm, and m- many of us are, you know, like are, when we help these people, there's so many challenges for them to sure. above and beyond the food itself. Um, like you say, it's, it's, um, in, it's sort of reassuring them and saying like, keep going, keep going. But if they don't get that result within the week, the weight loss, it could be like, and similar is there's a, a plateau 
somebody had a question about, so these are questions that I get from, sure. from people. And when they hit a plateau so many times, and this could happen many weeks or months down the road, but when people hit a plateau, they generally get discouraged and they'll, and they bail on that. So do you have any um, thoughts or advice on what happens when these people get discouraged or hit a plateau? Right. Um, the, the issue is, is that this is a very interesting principle that, that, um, once you grasp it, it, it sort of puts you in control of understanding what's happening. People need to understand the concept of an equilibrium. So let me give you an example. If you have a boat uh, floating on a calm lake um, and it's floating one foot under the water, the, the hull, the uh, a little tiny sabot kind of a boat, and then you step in that sabot and you lie down, then your extra weight pushes the boat down further in the water and now we're, you know, 18 inches below the, the water line. And then you get out of the boat, and then it goes back to uh, a foot under the water. And then you had some big old jugs of water in the boat, and you take those out, and now it goes above, uh, it rises further in the water, and now it's only eight inches deep in the water. In other words, it's going back and forth and back and forth where, where it stands relative to the water line, dependent upon the gravitational forces that are involved in the boat. Now, that's exactly what your weight is doing. Your weight is simply moving around. It's moving towards an equilibrium, and then it'll hit an equilibrium. When you step in the boat, you're, it's actually in disequilibrium for a few minutes as the boat now is bumping up and down in the water as the dynamics of that situation are not stable. As soon as you settle down, now you're down 18 inches in the water and it's stable. Your, your weight is essentially a... a um, a math problem that involves a very few variables. One of them is your genetics. The second is how much exercise that you're doing. And the third is the content of your diet. And all of them are actually important, but the most important are, are your genetics and the content of your diet. Exercise is a third variable in this that is not as significant, uh, but it, it does exist. Now, so we could have a person who, let's suppose that they're eating a conventional American diet and they're 40 years old and they're 50 pounds overweight. And what they hear is, you know, they've gone on diets before where they try to restrict their calories for a while and push themselves away from the table and they walk around the block and they lose six pounds and then they give up and, uh, and as, soon as, uh, as soon as they stop doing this, they go back to their 40 pounds overweight and they say, well, that's my set point. Okay? And that's what people believe. That that's my set point. That is not a set point. There is actually no such thing as a set point. What there is is that there's an equilibrium point if, you're, if your exercise and your diet and your genes are stable. And since your genes are always basically stable, the two variables that are in the equation are what is it that you're eating and what your exercise process is. So let me give you an example. A man uh, came to me and explained. Uh, up at a, a, a lecture, he and his wife, they were in their 70s, and he came up and he told me a story, and uh, he had been, he was about 5'8", about 160 pounds, and he said, I used to be 380 pounds, which to me was unbelievable that that was true, and his wife is sitting there nodding her head and smiling, and what he did was he went on the McDougal program, and so at 380 pounds, he went on the McDougal program, and over the next year, he lost about 100 pounds. So he lost about two pounds a week, which means we knew that he was really doing it. And then he hit, quote, a plateau. He hit a plateau in the upper twos. And there he sat for several months. And he still knows that he's 100 pounds overweight, obviously. And so he, uh, he called John McDougall and he said, I'm 100 pounds overweight and I'm doing your program perfectly. What's the deal? And McDougal says, are you doing any exercise? And he says, no. And McDougal said, walk around the block once a day. Okay. So the man genetically could not get away with no exercise. He needed to actually walk around his block once a day, which he then did. And in the next year, he lost 120 pounds. So now, now he did hit a set point, quote, he hit biological optimum at about 160 pounds. And that's where you will sit. And in this case, at an appropriate level exercise for him and an appropriate diet for humans, and the problem is solved. Now, had he only walk, walked around the block halfway, he might have wound up at 225 pounds. You know, there's no, 
there are an infinite number of combinations that he could have hit 243 pounds. He could have hit, hit could put 184 pounds. In other words, there's any number of uh, there's an infinite number of set points that people will hit or plateaus, but you have not actually hit any biological limit. What we've hit is a is a equilibrium for your genetics and your activity level and your diet. And all you must do at that point is to either clean up the diet a little more or start to exercise, and you will not maintain excess weight. Uh, maintaining excess weight on an organism is inconsistent with the natural history of all species. Uh, you are not designed to carry around extra weight that is a biological uh, impairment. Uh, your genes will help you out of this trap if you do the right things and you do them long enough and well enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a while. I, I essentially look at, you know, calories in and out, and I know there's things, fats and carbs and all that work in different ways, but it's a, it's a good estimate to me. Um, cause you know, there's a lot of denial about like, you know, what not, you know, what they're eating essentially. Um, and, and so you forget what you ate and you don't really, you ate more than, um, somebody might eat more than they, than they are aware of. So, or snack did things that they didn't think was going to be a problem there's a lot of people that say you know i'm not really doing the diet but i'm not getting the results and so i kind of you know you have to be gentle but we're trying to say like do the you know, 95 i mean you don't have to be perfect nobody's perfect but um i think in general there's a lot of things going off plan more than people are aware of that's affecting the results there's something that they really don't know about sometimes people are very sincere and they're doing a very good job as, as best they know, and there's a few mistakes that they could be making that they're not aware of. One of the mistakes that people are unaware of is that when they process food in their own blender, that this is actually can be a problem. So the, uh, they, they might not understand that, that when you soften food artificially, uh, let's suppose that they're making soups and juices and smoothies, and they think that this is a great thing because the food, the food stuffs, the basic food stuffs are very healthy. The, uh, this can keep weight on people, and the reason why this is true is that the food, your digestive system was designed by nature to signal to you how much food to eat, uh, depending upon the basic uh, a series of receptor processes that go on during digestion. If you disturb those processes by essentially pre-digesting food in a blender, that you, you put food through steel teeth you know, moving 1,000 miles an hour, that, that obliterate the fibrous matrix of food, and then you drink those calories, then your stomach does not have to go through the muscular contractions that are necessary in order to digest the food. And also the stretch process where there's been food sitting in the stomach of X amount of calories for X amount of time does not occur because the, because the food's been pre-digested, it will move more quickly from the stomach to the small intestine and therefore, it will not feel like you ate 300 calories. It'll feel like you ate 150 calories. And so people uh, need to know that this is, this is actually a fairly substantial issue. And um, in fact, experiments have shown that when you, when you uh, soften food substantially, you will effectively re uh, reduce the calories needed to digest it by 12.5% or so. So what you're effectively doing is adding 12.5% of calories to your food. Well, we talked about earlier that, that um, the average American woman is gaining about 20 calories a day over her lifetime. That's not very much. It's about she's systematically overeating by 1%. Uh, instead of eating about 2,000 calories, maybe she's eating 2,020. That is enough to actually have her maintain a very substantial excess weight load on her body. So if the system is fooled enough, it can miss it by 1%. When you start blending food uh, and, and using those sort of techniques, nut butters, for example, uh, people will feel like, well, all the, the data says that nuts are fine and that you know the, the experts say that nuts are healthy, whole natural food. They are. But not, a nut butter is not a whole natural food. And uh, it seems like it is. It feels like it should be, but it's not. And as a result, what you've done when you put, put those uh, nuts through those steel teeth and make a nut butter, you've systematically increased the, 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 the caloric concentration of that food by 12.5%. It's like you added some oil to it. And uh, as a result of that, 
when they have done animal experiments on this, you'll see animals get fat on exactly the same food, but where the food has been uh, processed in this way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, hamburger is substantially more calorie dense than the steak that it comes from. Not because there's actually any more calories in it if you counted calories in a, in a calorie counter. But uh, as far as the animal is concerned that's digesting it, it's 12.5% more concentrated in calories. That's a very substantive issue uh, for people, and it's a really important, honest mistake that they can be making. That's why one of the cues here is we say whole natural foods, whole natural foods. That's the thing that you don't want to miss. Whole natural foods means whole. Try to eat the foods as much as possible in the way that they came out of nature that your ancestors would have eaten them. If you do that, you will not systematically overeat and you'll get the life that you deserve. Yeah, because Dr. Greger did a video um, and he was, you know, people used to, you know, a lot of people saying the smoothies and, uh, you know, you're blending it and breaking down the fiber. And then he, sh he was sort of saying, like, why does people eat soup? Like Jeff Novick and that. They recommend, you know, you start with a salad and a soup and then the, the meal. And one of the things with soup is because you're eating with a spoon and it's hot, you generally eat, eat it slower. Because people were saying with smoothies, you know, you should chew it or something to make it, you know, to make it seem like you're chewing it. But they showed that, you know, that that was the main issue was the speed of the, of the eating. So he was, he was basically saying that with a smoothie, because the smoothies are, you know, at one point, were showing that problem, but they were like, you could drink it pretty quickly. You could scarf it down pretty quickly. But if you, if you had it at the same rate as like a soup, that you mm. can sort of mimic that effect just because it's you're, um, it's slowing down the entry. Now I would say this: that when it comes to these sorts of foods, the um, I, I give them a B. The, this is healthy food, and we process them some, and this is not this is not any big crisis. However. If you're somebody who has hit an equilibrium and you're 25 pounds overweight, you, you were 50 pounds overweight, now you're 25 and you've hit an equilibrium, and you're eating what you think is really healthy food, one place to look is how much of the food are you processing in this way. Yeah. And so that's um, for, for other people who are doing well and they are losing weight and they are moving towards uh, a, a very healthy equilibrium and they're using smoothies and, and blended soups. My attitude is fine, have at it. I, I have no, no problem with this. But keep in mind that I, I would say probably the biggest culprit though is when we start adding nuts and seeds into blended food because uh, people can then, uh, they, they can start eating a lot more of these high fat foods pretty easily mm -hmm. and that, that, can, that can be a problem. Yeah. No, I, I really like the idea of equilibrium because um, there's always something that could be done at that point, like troubleshooting. Like, you know, of course. Like you, said. You, you were, you, people, sometimes they're very frustrated because they feel like there's no way out and that it just it cannot work. And what they need to understand is that nature did not make you wrong. The, the, um, of course, there are people that sometimes have uh, medical problems that are contributing to this. So once in a while, somebody has a thyroid condition it's actually contributing to this. Uh, but that's not common. So most of the time, when people are struggling with their weight, there is nothing wrong with their biology. And usually, interestingly enough, people that have excess weight are usually quite fundamentally healthy. They, they're absorbing their food very well. Uh, the people at True North that come in that, that have serious problems, the ones we're most afraid of are the ones that are thin. It's like, uh-oh, you, you, you're... We've got some absorption problems here. We've got some serious biomechanical problems, and we're going to have to. This is going to be a tricky to, to get this person well. When, when I, we see a person walk in that's 30, 40, 50, or 100 pounds overweight, we usually relax. We realize, oh, their underlying biology, their underlying constitution is strong as an ox. They may have type 2 diabetes at this point because they've got too much fat on their bodies, but we're fundamentally in really good shape. And all we need to do is start feeding these people healthy food, and it's all going to start to go the right direction, which it, it generally does. So the, oh, I was going to say that we're, no animal in nature is designed to, when eating its natural diet, they aren't, they, you, you have to understand they would never allow in nature the possibility 
that you would overeat and store excess fat to a level that you would be sexually unattractive. That would be a biological disaster of epic proportions. So it is, does not happen. When people eat the diet of their natural history, they do not systematically overeat and they do not carry excess body fat in a way that would cause them to be less sexually attractive. Uh, if they did, that gene that would cause that to happen would rapidly be selected out by, by evolutionary processes. So it does not happen. And uh, that's why when, when people switch to this way of eating and they, and they troubleshoot the, the few things that may stop them, they rapidly go to a place that essentially optimizes their appearance. Yeah. And uh, with, in the genetic area, because you've mentioned this a couple times, um, like I noticed in my case, when I gained a lot of weight uh, prior to going this way, um, you know, my wife didn't gain as much nearly as much as I did. And what are the, um, what are the specific reasons for that? Like from a genetic perspective, like for example, one of my theories, cause people always say metabolism, but for me, it's more like efficiency or like the absorption, like you said, how much you actually absorb. Because when I would go to bed, at, if I ate a fatty meal, like a dairy and sour cream cheese and stuff like that, potato chips, I would go to bed, like I'd eat that at five or six o'clock and I would go to bed at midnight and I'd still be full and totally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But other people, it, it sort of goes through them, and the next thing you know, they're, they're hungry, you know, a couple hours later, and I'm, I'm, and I'm you know, in pain and stuff like that. So um, if you want to talk about that absorption versus, like, metabolism and other um, aspects to genetics where somebody wouldn't gain as much weight as someone else. Yes, people, one of the worthless processes that's going on today is all these discussions about absorptions, individual differences in metabolism and all this sort of thing. The, um, and whether or not you've got cortisol in there because you're stressed and et cetera, et cetera. This is a total waste of time. The, um, let, let's look at the facts. The facts are is that, that there are individual differences in, in the genetic code. That's what makes one person different from the other. Uh, everybody's genes are almost exactly identical. So there's a reason why your kidney is in the same place that everybody else's kidney is, is because you've got genes that have made, made you a human as opposed to an aardvark, and therefore those genes are all essentially the same. So human beings, over 99% of your genes are exactly the same as everybody else on Earth. Now, there are subtle little individual differences, and they, they make up for tiny little stylistic uh, differences between people. So, for example, uh, some people have blue eyes, some people have brown eyes, green eyes, etc. The uh, some people's hair is blonde, some people's hair is red, some people's hair is black, um, etc. Et and brown. These are all these stylistic little differences. The uh, the hair, for example, doesn't really make much difference biologically whether that hair is blonde or brown. In other words, it's still an insulating factor for the top of your head and helps save. Uh, heat from escaping, but the bottom line is, is it's, it's we've got a little stylistic difference. It's the equivalent of whether your your Model T Ford is painted red or painted black. It's still the same car, and so it's also going to be true that there's going to be subtle stylistic differences in in uh, how this organism looks in terms of its morphology, how muscular it's going to be. So uh, that's going to be because. There's going to be a genetic lineage that had to deal with evolutionary stresses uh, in the environment of that natural history of that particular organism where it paid to be, for example, a little bit stronger than somebody else. So there's going to be places in the world where you're going to see where the people are tall and thin, and there's going to be places in the world where you're going to see people are going to be short and stocky. And these are going to have to do with temperature utilization curves. There's going to be also uh, in environmental stressors what they do for a living, all kinds of little stylistic differences. They all have the same musculature. If you were a physiologist and you would say, well, it's not like over in Alaska, the, the natives there don't have biceps. They have some other kind of muscle. Now, they've all got exactly the same biceps. They all got the same exact origins and insertions of every muscle in this body. It fits exactly the same. Uh, whether they, they're from Africa or they're from Asia or they're from Northern Europe or they're from 
you know, Alaska. It doesn't make any difference. It's all exactly the same. All you're going to see is these very, very subtle stylistic differences. So when it comes to fat, fat storage, you are going to see st subtle stylistic differences. The reasons are that these genes went through different sorts of challenges over the last several thousand years. So, for example, in the South Sea Islands, um, there was a migration that started out off the coast of uh, South Asia and went eventually through boats all the way to Hawaii. It took several thousand years of migration to get there. During that process, the people that would sometimes get on a boat and head to a new island to get rid of the old chief because uh, they were tired of them chasing their wives, um, what would happen is, is that some of the people would die on the journey because when they got on that boat and they headed out to a new island, they might not have got there uh, in time to get new food. And the only ones on that boat that survived were the ones that started out with a little bit more fat storage on them, i.e. slightly different genetics than the other guy. And as you do this sequentially for 3,000 years, you're going to find that by the time you get to Hawaii, the natives there are stocky by nature. But are they fat? And the answer is no. Not a single one of them was fat. And they're not fat because they're eating the natural history of their species. But when, when the Americans come with McDonald's uh, 200 years later and you flood those peoples with artificially concentrated foods, they get huge. So now we have a, an environmental disaster where those genes are not, those very interesting genes, i.e. very thick and muscular and curvy genes, now meet a modern environment with foodstuffs that are a disaster for them, they get huge. So if you are a person that is now 297 pounds and five foot six, I guarantee you that your genetic lineage went through a set of peoples that uh, in the last few hundred years lived under pretty in, in acute deprivation. And um, that means that you're probably not French uh, because it's going to turn out that they had fairly constant food steps in, in uh, France across the last several centuries. And so as a result, most of those people have thinner genotypes. But if, as you go in different places, even in Northern Europe, those genes went through different sorts of dep uh, deprivation uh, circumstances, and you wound up got it getting natural selection for individuals with thicker genotypes. And so this is the deal, and none of us have to be intimidated by this. All we have to do is you have to eat the food of your natural history, and it doesn't matter what your genotype is. It's going to head to a place where you're healthy and attractive. Yeah, you just focus on what you can change, not stuff that you can't really. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Um, so many things that you talked about, I want to go into, but I I wanted to get through these questions. Sure. Uh, so it's too bad, but um, I'll try to. But related to um, the fasting process, um, there's people doing short-term, uh, fairly restrictive diets, like uh, even more so than search solution like Mary's Mini is an example, but um, right now there's a couple of, uh, yeah, potato, it's like Mary's Mini with the potato as the, as the starch, and there's a guy, there's another guy doing um, all potatoes pretty much for like a year, and the reasoning, well, there's different reasons, but it, one of the reasons is food addictions, to break that cycle, um, and I know that fasting can also do that, so What's your, what are your thoughts on some of these seven-day things, cleanses, and, and not, not like a liver cleanse, but I mean um, a very restrictive, uh, in terms of what the variety of food is for a short period of time to kind of reset? or? Yeah, I think um, here's my general strategy. General strategy is that we want the, the palate to be uh, more sensitive. We want it to be more sensitive to the really the, the good flavors that are in whole natural food. Sometimes people are basically think that we are all just bluffing, uh, those of us that eat healthy food, and that we really don't like the food that well, and um, that we're all we're all so, sort of a member of a cult that is pretending to enjoy ourselves when we don't. And that is not true. And the reason why their intuition is off 
is because their own palate is not sufficiently sensitive. And they actually don't think that you could really like whole natural food. And yet, uh, so if, if you're sort of caught in that suspicion that this is a little bit bogus and that people can't really like whole natural foods, I, I want you to conceptually consider the fact that you would never be designed to not be crazy about your whole natural food. Every aardvark loves aardvark food. Whales like whale food. Giraffes like giraffe food. And humans like human food. They are designed to. You have to be extremely motivated to go to the hassle and the risk to go out there and get food. And when you get there, it needs to be rewarded. And it is. So you are designed to love whole natural food. And if people don't love whole natural food, it's because their palate has now been adulterated and they're not sufficiently sensitive. So that's actually what's happening. Now, they don't know that it's happening. You, you can't see it happen. But you can observe the process if we do a few little techniques. So the, the, my fundamental thrust is to get people to understand that their nervous system changes, not the food. The food is not changing. The food is the food. The, uh, your nervous system's reaction to it, though, can change dramatically in the same way that your eyes can adjust to light when you go into a movie theater, and then you can, you can get uh, much more sensitive to, to, uh, to light after it gets darker, in the same way that you can get much more sensitive to the taste of the food when we dial down the total excitation of the food. And so the, the fastest way to do this is with water. So a person can go on a water fast for a day or two, uh, two days is no joke for most people, but a day is well within people's ability to get it out. If they will do this, even, for example, not eating in the morning and not eating in the afternoon and waiting till the evening, if they'll just do that, their taste buds will become considerably more acute even by the end of the day. And so it's essentially they will have fasted 24 hours uh, since the previous evening. If they will do that, they will discover that simpler foods, uh, if they will challenge themselves with a, a, a simpler food than they would normally eat, they will find that they like it better. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes um, some people might actually be struggling enough that that doesn't do that much. But I'll tell you what, if you do a two or three day juice fast where you just use a couple of uh, natural, uh, or like a fresh juices, say carrot and apple juice or something like that, uh, I tend to mix those two together so we get a little bit of minerals along with the sugars. If people will do a two-day juice fast, they will find that after two days, their palate is much more sensitive to the fats that come in, in normal levels and even something like oatmeal and, and modest amounts of sodium. So suddenly they don't need to be eating greasy uh, fried food filled with oil and salt. Suddenly a food that is much healthier has more kick to it. And that's exactly what happens with your eyes. We, we dim the lights down and they become more sensitive. We dim the food down back to where it belongs and your taste buds become more sensitive. So the sometimes people need to do this 30 times. They need to do it over and over again. They need to get the concept in their head that if they stay on a healthy path for a while and it doesn't take that long, their taste buds will become sufficiently more sensitive that it is not a sacrifice to eat this food. We are not a bunch of saints. We, we are not. The, the truth is, is that I prefer to eat simple, healthy food to over doctored up food. So I, I went out with my sweetheart last night to Valentine's Day to a fancier place, and we ate richer food last night because it's Valentine's Day, and I couldn't take her to the cheap place that we, I would normally take her to that has the really basic, decent food for $12. That just wouldn't have been right. So we went to the nicer place, and it was greasy, and it was oily, and it was saltier, and I didn't like it. <laughs> okay? And she didn't either. But she appreciated that more money was spent and that we did it the way you're supposed to do it. And they had candles and all this sort of jazz. But the truth is, is that I didn't like it. And uh, I'm not going back tomorrow. And if you said, oh, well, actually, it's really rich food, but they've now they've got a coupon and you can get it at a fourth the price so you can go back and eat the cheap. It can be cheap. I don't want it. It's cheap, greasy crap, and I don't like the taste of it. Yeah. And so this is actually what happens uh, when you get your palate appropriately adjusted. The, the other food is too rich. 
once you reach that point, uh, and I'm not saying that I'm at a point where I never like something that's not doctored up a little bit. I do. But I never lose my taste for the absolute straight healthy food as well. Once you get your palate to that level, you're not going to lose your way because you don't want to go back. And that's, that's the safe place. And that's not being brainwashed. That's just having your, your nervous system appropriately calibrated. Yeah. Yeah, I found that as well. I never used to eat vegetables now because your palate was just not into those things. And then now, even if I do something non-ideal, it's, um, it's not like you're off the rails forever then once you've you know, got tempted by something. No, um, not at all. But the people that are, you know, you're talking about that say they're eating the typical diet – um, and they look at vegans or plant-based people and that, that like to me, like you talked about pleasure and pain, pain from the food perspective, but also like they don't have a reason or it, uh, they don't think they have one. They may not have a reason to, to want to change. Like I find the vast majority of people are doing this because they, there's a, there's a problem. Like they're not going to seek out this lifestyle for no reason in general. Like there's other reasons like, um, ethicals and environmental, but, right. um, some of these concepts, like people will not seek it out. And then when they start doing it and they have bloating or hunger or whatever, um, they're experiencing more pain, you know, because it's, it's not, um, and that pain and they have these pleasurable foods that they've been eating for so long. So there's no incentive from that perspective. It's interesting. This whole bloating thing is very interesting. I think maybe, uh, like I never experienced this and, but I'm thinking, I'm trying to think about why, and maybe it's because, People, people might, if they jump, they might jump a little too radically and thinking that a, a, a healthy diet has huge quantities of uh, vegetables in it or huge quantities of salad. Instead of doing something that is a little more consistent with the, the, the fibrous process, you know, uh, foods that they've been eating now, but just improve them. So eat veggie burgers instead of burgers, you know what I'm saying? Um, Eat, eat baked potatoes that you can dip in ketchup rather than French fries. These are uh, eat a small salad if you haven't been eating salad at all. The the uh, eat a few vegetables that are well steamed instead of some other thing that you've been eating. These are make modest changes. Um, the uh, in ways instead of having a a ham and cheese sandwich, have a avocado and and lettuce and tomato sandwich with some pickles. In other words, it makes some things that, that are very similar, even in terms of their concentration, um, and the, to the kind of things that you've already been eating, but just make better choices. And I don't think that most people will have that much digestive disruption. I can see going from, going from a very rich animal-based diet to a very, you know, uh, a very healthy whole foods diet with a bunch of steamed vegetables and salad that that I could see how that would be a problem. Um, you're going to get loose stools as, as you don't have as much, uh, starchy, starchy fiber. So if you, you get away from the starches, you're going to, it's going to be surprising to you what's going to happen. Uh, you actually need some of that material to kind of hold stools together. Um, these are some little, little learning pieces of the learning curve. Uh, that people don't know, but you know, eat rice and beans and potatoes. That's sort of the center of what it is that you want to be eating. And these other things are at the periphery. And if you do that, there shouldn't be that big a problem. So if somebody, like I mentioned, uh, with the potato only diet for like a year or even that seems to be a long time, but for 30 days and stuff, um, even though there might be some nutrient potential issues, um, the, the, if the goal is that reset of the palate, like what's, what's a good length of time? I know you said it could happen multiple times, but is there any period of time that if you're eating food per se, like not as opposed to fasting, that somebody should be able to get over the issues? Oh, I mean, you're, you're moving out of those issues. It's just like when you go into a movie theater, in one day, that palate starts to change. In other words, it, it's moving in the right direction instantly. So there's not some length of time that's magic. Uh, if people want to do these mono diets, I mean, I, I think that's a hard way to go. I mean, I've never done anything like that. The, um, the, the, you know, I just moved towards healthier food. 
And I like the variety. When I, when I steam up vegetables, which I do two or three times a week, there's going to be carrots and there's going to be asparagus and there's going to be sweet potatoes and there's going to be corn on the cob. There's going to be a variety uh, and a bunch of spinach in there. I mean, there's a lot of different flavors in there and I never get bored. So it, it isn't actually necessary to do a Spartan mono diet in order to sort of get yourself on track. Um, but if people want to do such a thing, you know, have at it. There will not be any nutrient deficiency issues. People are not going to wind up with nutrient deficiency problems on a mono diet like that probably ever. You, you could essentially eat steamed potatoes and live on steamed potatoes and probably not wind up with a nutrient deficiency of any kind, maybe for years, if ever. So um, th that is the least of our concerns. The, but it is not necessary to be so, so uh, vigorous uh, with yourself on this issue. It's going to turn out the chemical census studies will show us that a palate will change uh, all the way from a standard American palate, which is a palate that, that, that is now used to very high quantities of fat, very high quantities of salt and sugar. Um, essentially, it's a blunted palate where the people cannot feel the whole natural food very well. You can change all the way from there to a perfectly regulated palate of a, of a natural human in about four months. That's about what it takes. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that you can get, it's not linear. So you can get probably more than halfway there in three weeks. So if people will, will do a good job or even a couple weeks, they are out of the, the toughest part of the curve. And I believe that they can get out of the toughest part of the curve even faster with things like occasionally 24-hour uh, fasts. If you do that you know, one or you know, a day, for example, a day a week for about three weeks, though each of those days is really helping sharpening your palate. Or if you do a one or two-day juice fast, those are really helping sharpening your palate. Um, all we have to do is realize it's a game. We're playing a chess game against our, our taste buds, and we have to just move the pieces well enough to beat them, and they are very easily beatable. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not fighting you, uh, but they will take some territory back every time you eat crap. And so we just have to make enough good decisions that we move them consistently to a place of greater sensitivity, and when we do, we don't want to eat the crap as much. And, uh, and even if, when you do, you don't give back that much territory and you get to a place where you enjoy healthy food and you're not grandstanding it. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Speaking of nutrients, like, um, there is some differences in opinion. I've talked to some people that when, you know, I have a starch based diet and people can live on potatoes for years and that kind of attitude. And then there's the nutri nutrient or nutritarian. I mean, there's Dr. Furman, Dr. Uh, Gregor to some extent. If you go on chronometer, for example, there'll be this thing like selenium and you need a Brazil nut every day. And I kind of ask myself, well, what are like a lot of people around the world done in the past when there wasn't Brazil nuts sitting there? And yeah. so what's your take on some of these nutrients that people seem to think they have to have a nut or something to get? You know, uh, a great motivational speaker in Southern California, a legendary man by the name of Jim Rohn in the 1980s, uh, had a phrase. He says, people major in minor things. Okay? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, this, is, this issue of nutrient density and concern about nutrients is absolutely minor league, small time peanuts, and people need to get over it. It is not an important issue. The, uh, you need to understand that your intuition here, Will, is exactly right. That people around the world very often lived in ecological circumstances where the diets were extremely narrow. And um, they did not have, they didn't, weren't able to walk into a grocery store and have 200 different bunch of produce from all over the world or grown in hothouses. You know, people, people very often had very, very narrow diets. And it turns out that what happens to the body when it faces a diet uh, that is very low in some given nutrient or vitamin or mineral, uh, what it will do is that the genes have mechanisms to essentially recycle those nutrients very, very efficiently. So it, it is not necessary to be at the levels that if we were to say, oh, well, all human beings have level X 
uh, the given nutrient, and therefore they see that the RDA believes that we need X amount uh, of this to eat, and then you're not eating it, that this is a bad thing. It's ludicrous. The truth is, is that your genes beautifully now realize that they are living in an environment of lower concentration of that nutrient, and they start to recycle that nutrient more efficiently, and it's simple. This is child's play for the genetic code. And um, so this is, a, this is majoring in minor things. People need to know that for every individual who has their health compromised behind some vitamin or mineral deficiency, there are a thousand people who have their health compromised because of dietary excesses. And so it's, it's not even close. I would tell people never worry about a deficiency. And people also have this, um, people have a natural tendency of the, I believe it's embedded into the neural coding of humans to worry about deficiency. And let me tell you why it is that I think that they do. That if you watch a young mother or father with their, with their infant children, the conversation between the mother and father is about, did he get enough to eat? Did he eat? Did she eat? Did she get enough? Did, in other words, there is an incessant fascination with making sure that that infant gets enough food. This tells us, if we didn't already know or from thinking about it, that the threat of death by starvation has been an enormously important problem for our species. And it's an enormously important problem for all species. So the, the concept uh, to the human mind of deficiency is one that has that is front and center in terms of people's considerations and worries. That comes naturally to people. What does not come naturally to people is any worry about dietary excess. No human beings ever died of dietary excesses. This is not a problem of natural history of any species at any time. It was never the problem. It is only a problem today. Now, if we actually autopsy people, we find that they're dying early of diseases of dietary excess. Nobody's dying of diseases of dietary deficiency. Okay, so the, uh, so the, the concern on the part of these doctors, these doctors are, uh, have already, already know the big picture. So whether it's Dr. Furman or Dr. Gregor, or the, these guys are smart guys. They already know the big picture, but now what's happening is they're wandering into the weeds of these very small details. Uh, could they be correct in some ways? Could there be one in 17,000 uh, patients that winds up with a vitamin or mineral deficiency that would have been better off with a Brazil nut a day? Uh, possibly, even likely, that that could be true. But let's keep focused on you. And you are likely not to be one of those 17,000 people that doesn't have a little enzyme that allows you to recycle uh, that particular nutrient if you wind up with a nutrient deficient situation. See what I'm saying? So you are likely to be a normal stock human that will never face a vitamin deficiency problem in your life uh, because you've got normal recycling machinery. So as a result, the last thing on earth that anybody needs to be worried about is deficiencies. The, um, there is one exception, perhaps two. And the exception is in the modern environment, if you choose to be a vegan, which is an unnatural diet, by the way, it is not the natural diet of our history. We actually believe it is a superior diet to the diet of our natural history. As our humanoid ancestors went from being a vegan uh, to adapting to the utilization of meat uh, in order to be able to traverse uh, larger expanses of the globe. So by, uh, if you're going to be a wandering primate and you're going to be willing to leave your homeland and cross rivers and you're not sure where your next meal is going to be coming from, then it makes sense to widen your palate. And this species did widen its palate to include hunting, uh, but it was an additional, it was not an original diet for the species, it was an additional diet for the species. And as a result of that, yeah, the, the, uh, our digestive process has co-opted machinery uh, in order to allow that process to happen and utilize this food, but it's a little bit rough. We can see that animal food is a little bit rough on people uh, relative to plant food, and that's why when we get higher concentrations of it, we start seeing things like cardiovascular disease and cancer at higher rates because it's just a little bit rougher fuel. Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, I, you see what happens to me. I lose my place. The, uh, the, <laughs> but the point is is that we are, uh, we are perfectly designed to be a vegan, and yet it's going to turn out 
that if you are a vegan in a very uh, antiseptic environment where all the fruits and vegetables are washed and you do not eat any animal food, which therefore you're not eating anything with bacterial contamination, which uh, animal food is full of it, uh, from that bacterial contamination in animal food, you'll get vitamin B12 being formed. And as a result of that, um, you were designed by nature to be eating some of that animal food with its bacterial contamination. And so you lost the ability to recycle brilliantly the vitamin B12 in a deficiency situation. So therefore, it's uh, because it was so ubiquitous. There's so much vitamin B12 in anything that you, any diet of a normal people uh, that might have had 10% of its calories from animal food. If you choose to eat a really pristine diet uh, of vegan matter, and it turns out that that vegan material also doesn't even have any dirt on it because it's been washed, then you could wind up with a vitamin B12 deficiency, and it makes sense to take a vitamin B12 pill. Okay, That's it. That's where the evidence, that's the end of the evidence. Now, the other issue would be uh, vitamin D, which there are people now that spend an awful lot of time indoors and don't spend very much time out of doors. And so there's some controversy over whether or not some people might be better off with vitamin D supplementation. I, I believe that it's, that's a mixed bag on that evidence and it's not all that clear. I do know that you're probably better off with more sun than most people are getting. And that's probably how we ought to do it. Um, but aside from that, everything else on the table is minor things. And we need to not be, your, your worries about those things should be one one thousand of the worries that you have about dietary excesses. And so uh, that, that's where I come down on that. And I, I think that's what people's focus needs to be. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. There's so many other things I could ask you, but um, <laughs> it's getting, you know, we're at an hour, almost an hour here. Um, just before we go, I noticed you did a, 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 a talk on self-esteem, and I was wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit and if you're um, – you had mentioned a website that you were doing at one point. Well. Yes. My whole thing in this life is uh, it's actually not diet and health. I mean, that's sort of the foundation. And uh, I think that that's where we begin a pursuit of, of good life is we, we don't want to be compromised there. But what I'm most interested in is in human happiness. And I'm most interested in what we're going to call esteem processes. In other words, how it is that we feel about ourselves and how it feels to us to be earning esteem from other people that we like and respect. And so uh, my website is called esteemdynamics.org, and it's uh, really trying to help people in these processes that, have, that are central to, to human life satisfaction, whether it's romance, friendship, business, family relationships, all these sorts of things. The, um, uh, I've, done, uh, I, I've done webinars for the McDougall program uh, where there are, well, are there little slideshows that I've talked people through. Um, how esteem processes work, and if people go to the, that that website, they can see those things uh, for, for free. And I just try to make make this material available. That's sort of the. I just got a website. You know, we're now 2016. I I'm just getting getting on board. I'm very non techy and uh, so now over the next year or so, a whole lot more information about uh, esteem processes is going to be going up on that website. Yeah, that's uh, like I, um, it was sort of a surprise. Like I, when I switched to this style and I started sharing the food, I, nobody really cared on my Facebook page. So I started a separate page, like outside of like a business page or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and um, all of a sudden people started liking it. And then I started a YouTube channel and it's just like this, like so much interest. And I found that, um, you know, there's, I definitely like the self-esteem of, getting attention, getting people that enjoy the recipes and tell you that they enjoy it and that it's changed their lives. That's great. But it's also a balancing act with um, the negativity or any kind of comments. Like, so if you're on, if you have a, you know, it's very interesting. I don't know if you talked about this or we could talk about it another time, but the, um, you know, you're putting yourself out on social media and you're presenting, uh, this is what I do, or this is my opinion. And then of course you're going to get negative comments or disagreements. And so there's a, there's some, a lot of stress, and when you go in the comments, there's a lot of debates going on. And I find, like, from a happiness perspective, I'm, I'm sharing, I keep focusing on the fact that I'm sharing this information with people to help humanity and animals and environment. But, but there's also a, a very 
um, difficult challenge by putting yourself out there. And you can get critiques on your physical appearance from right. uh, difference in opinions from not only mediators but within the plant-based community sure. and, and, and drama within that community. And so there's a lot of negativity and any kind of criticisms can really affect me as well at, at the yes. same time. Yeah, you want to uh, you want to you want to have your situation where you have to understand that um, that actually I believe on my website there may be a, a video free called the perfect personality, and if there isn't, there will be. I'll put it up there. Uh, the about half of humanity, or certainly about twenty percent of them, twenty percent of humanity is pretty disagreeable. The um, if you think of a bell curve in terms of personalities, um, you have some people on one side of this bell curve. We could talk, talk about how agreeable people are. This is one of the most classic individual differences in personality. Um, there, there are other individual differences that are important. For example, how open to experience people are. So some people are very open and they jump off bridges and they've taken a bunch of illegal drugs and they want to travel to Kathmandu. Other people just want to stay in Bakersfield and never leave and marry their high school sweetheart. That's a very interesting individual difference that psychologists have looked at. And most people are somewhere in the middle. And most people want to visit Europe and see some things, but they, you know, they don't want to join a cult and an ashram because they're just not that open to experience. The, um, when it comes to agreeable, how sort of pleasant people are, most people are pretty pleasant. But you have to remember that 20% of humanity is pretty unpleasant. And so those people will fight and criticize and squabble, and they're basically like little wolverines. And, um, and when it comes to social media, they can be responsible for a tremendous – they are responsible for the vast majority of the negative feedback processes that go on. And we want to insulate ourselves against those people as much as possible. Uh, this is a key component of what I call steam dynamics. They are sending negative esteem signals in order to enhance their esteem. They can't help it. They're designed by nature that way. And I would absolutely encourage you and everybody else to understand that your life is better if we mute those voices out of our lives and focus on um, esteem processes with people that are uh, much much more normal and, and don't try to convince everybody of everything or get uh, universal agreements because the truth is, is that those 20% are responsible uh, for essentially all frivolous lawsuits and almost every fist fight in every bar and every screaming match uh, that there is. This is who they are, and they're not going to change. But you can you can essentially uh, uh, operate your life to where we we mute them as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. It's essentially your look at your life as a radio station, and if you like soft, uh, pleasant, you know, pop rock. This is some scratchy, you know, nasty acid rock that comes on that station once in a while. Turn that station off as fast as turn it off as fast as we can uh, when we see them coming. Sounds good. I'll uh, I'll put a link to your website in the description below once it's up on YouTube and uh, people can makes it easier for them to click on it. And, but I'm fantastic. Uh, so somebody had bought steamdynamic.com, so I did, didn't get it, and I thought, fine, I'll do but org. And uh, I like it better that way. It seems more, uh, uh, it, it seems nice and pleasant. So that's what it's going to be. Sounds good. I wish you luck with the, with the site. I'm definitely going to check it out. I recommend everybody else check it out as well. Cool. Thanks so well, much, Dr. Law. It's been a great chat. And um, hopefully it helps people. That's all I'm trying to do is get some information out there to people. And I think you have provided some excellent information. Absolutely. Great talking to you. And let, let me know anytime if you want to talk more about different things. I think I'll take you up on that sometime. Thanks so much, Dr. Lyle. Fabulous. We'll see you soon. See you later.